All right, welcome everybody. Lecture three. Uh, everybody has, seems to be going fairly well in PhoneGap from what I've seen, so a lot of activity going on in the forums there. And uh, thanks to everyone who's done their homework. I've, over the next couple of days, I'm going to be going through that and having a good look at what everybody's done. So it's really great to, to see everyone so involved there. So um, tonight, we're going to be talking uh, about uh, a little bit more. We're going to be digging into the API um, to a fair degree, going through exactly all the different things we can do with PhoneGap and, and accessing the hardware. Um, so a bit of a recap from last week. We looked at a very basic HTML5 site. I gave you a little skeleton to start work, something that would sort of uh, look slightly like an app that you could work with. And then we started triggering the camera from it. So we, I guess we looked at how everything hangs together and where PhoneGap fits in relation to the HTML. And then we did a few builds from there. Um, and uh, distributed well we built one for iOS and did another one for Android now I noticed that there's just before we go too much further I noticed that there was a question here in terms of someone trying to create an iOS build um, in PhoneGap build and having some problems with it there shouldn't be a need for you to have a license key uh, unless you are trying to distribute to the store so we're actually going to talk about all those keys and signing things next week and exactly how you get something ready so if you're if, you're, if it's actually asking you for a license key, it sounds like there's something a bit wrong. So maybe if you're having that problem, put up a screenshot of what you're getting on the forum and I'll have a look at it for you. Um, in my builds, I haven't been asked for a license key at all and I have never entered that information as yet. So um, I'm a bit mystified as to why it would be doing that. But if you have any problems like that, just post it on the forum and I'll take a look for you. But as I said, next week, what we're going to be doing is looking at exactly how we go to that next level once you're happy with your app is how you get it all ready for the store. All right, now there was another question last week as well in regards to the Adobe Build uh, warning that's coming up when anyone tries to uh, put something up there. Um, I had a bit of a look into this just to see why it was and I, I updated dated my phone gap, made sure it had the most recent copy and I uh, did a Cordova build as well, updated that one just to see if it was somehow tied in with that and still kept getting the same error. So I, I did a bit more research into it and by the looks of things from what people are saying on various forums out there, there's an actual glitch with what Adobe have done on their build site and that they um, their most recent version of Build is actually referencing a non-existent version of PhoneGap. So that's why everybody's getting that warning. So I, I just uh, copied this out of the, one of the forums that explains what's going on. So by the time it gets to 3.7, it looks like then maybe that uh, we won't be getting that, that issue. But at any rate, it's nothing to worry about. So if you do see that warning when you're working with Build, um, that's what it's related to. It's nothing that you're doing wrong. All right. So today what we're going to be talking about is i've written here handing over the keys because pretty much what we're doing is going to go through the entire api or all the interesting bits anyway and tell you how you can access all the hardware so pretty much everything that's available to you on the phone and we're also going to look at some additional plugins too because the phone gap plugins that ship with it when you download it don't cover every single thing that you might like to do so th there are lots and lots of additional plugins that you can also link in um, and which will allow you to do all the rest of the stuff that you might possibly want to do so looking at the list and it's quite massive um, th there's not a lot of reason to have to go out to do anything natively when you've got all this stuff available to you so it's extremely powerful if you hadn't worked that out already from the past couple of weeks of what we're doing and then the, the last thing I'm going to do is, is set you a bit of an assignment slash homework. I'm going to tell you what it is now because as we go through the lecture, you, something might kind of jump out to you. What I want you to do is to take advantage of a couple of elements of the API and build yourself a little app uh, that can basically do something pretty cool. <laughs> so that's not very specific, but you'll see as we go along what I'm talking about. So what I want you to do is as we, I'll, I'll talk through some examples of what we can do with all these various APIs as we go through. And if something jumps out to you, then have a go at building something that uses those calls and, and see what you come up with and submit it. And what I'll be doing this week is going through all the submissions and we'll showcase the the best few next week so depending on what your availability is I realize everybody's got day jobs and things like that as well but if you feel like doing a little bit of development um, I'll showcase some of the, the good ones next week all right 
So without any further ado, let's get into it. So the first thing to really understand when dealing with PhoneGap is what event-driven programming is. So I will be referring to events all the way through. And uh, and so if you haven't got a background in, in programming or have, have heard about what this terminology is, um, it's, it will probably won't make a lot of sense. So what events are is that when, when a particular action occurs, you can subscribe to be notified when it occurs. So it might be when on a computer, when somebody presses a mouse button, then you will, uh, there will be a certain event triggered and then you'll get a notification that that event has happened and then you can do something about it. So before event driven programming or anything sort of orientated around events, what you had to do was polling, which was basically having an endless loop that sat there and listened and said, has somebody pressed the mouse button? Have they pressed the mouse button? Have they pressed the mouse button? Have they pressed the mouse button? And eventually somebody would, and then it would go off and call a function. So very, very inefficient to do things that way. That's called polling. And you really don't want to ever have to do that. So instead, what we do is we register to listen to certain events and then when those those events occur we'll be sent a message and so as soon as that message is triggered it will actually call our own function that we've set set up for that and then we can do something about it so it means we don't have to sit there listening at all we just go about doing whatever we want to do with the rest of the, the application in fact the application can just be sitting there and then when it gets that notification then it that calls that code that's associated with it so uh, something that responds to an event is called a handler and so we subscribe to these handlers and each part of the API has a number of events with handlers that we can set up so let's have get started and have a look at it so these these are all the various uh, API uh, sections I guess that we've got available to us though um, now each one of these actually have to be registered so if you remember from last week we actually had to to uh, make a call from the command line to get the camera into our PhoneGap project. And so that's the same with all of these. So each one of these is, is a separate file effectively. Um, and what it does mean is that you're only loading in stuff that you're interested in. So we can see here we've got the battery, cameras we've already seen, contacts, goes on, on the device, which we'll look at, which is all the details about that particular device. Um, we can track the high hardware that's uh, associated with um, the motion and orientation. So there's things like compass and GPS. And then we can even access the file system and do transfers and things like that. Now, some of these ones we're going to look at next week because we're not dealing with going uh, outside the device this week. So we're really going to deal with all the sensors today. So geolocation, globalization, glo good spelling mistake there, globalization, um, media, network, all sorts of stuff. So, so let's have a look at the first one. So if we wanted to access the battery, uh, what we have to do is we have to add that into our project, which is there. And then we have these three items here that we can have a listen to and, and see what's going on. So uh, let's have a look at the first one. So battery status. So this one fires if the battery changes by 1% or more, or if it's plugged or unplugged. So this one might be of use if you have a program which is, is using the battery a lot. So in this case, you might not want your program to be executing a particular piece of code unless it's plugged in. So a good example of this might be on iOS with Siri. Siri won't, won't respond to voice at a distance um, under iOS 8 unless it's plugged in. So you, um, if, if you're familiar with the new operating system for the iPhones, you can say, hey Siri to it, and it will respond, but only when it's plugged in. So this would be that kind of thing here. You can detect is the, uh, is the battery plugged in or not, and then you can execute some code. So what we've got here, if we have a look at the code that we've got here is window add event listener. So battery status is what we're listening to. So battery status being one of these here. And then on battery status is the name of our function, which in this case is this one here. Now we can call that anything we like. You don't have to call it on battery status, but I would advise you to come up with something that's fairly standardized so that you can work out what's going on. So you know that you're, you're dealing with a handler. It might be even that you call us handler on battery status or something. So anything, anything you like really, as long as it's standardized. And in this case, all we do is we're outputting something to the console 
which we've got this info here, which is coming back with information about the battery and we can work out whether or not it's plugged in and what the current level is. Now, if you want to find out more details about each of these, you just go to the phone gap documentation and all the stuff that I'm um, showing to you tonight and all this code is straight off the website where the API is defined. So um, you can get all these examples from the web. Obviously not with the same explanation, but um, if you want more details, it does go into further information there as well. So uh, battery critical and battery low are the other ones that you can subscribe to. And again, where there are things that are device specific, I'll, I'll let you know, but this is also in the API documentation because what can happen is that even though PhoneGap is designed to be as standardized, standardized as possible, it can happen that um, different devices will respond to things differently just by virtue of the fact that their hardware is different. So you might find that a, a Windows mobile device has a GPS that works in a slightly different way than perhaps an iOS one does. And so in that regard, perhaps it can't execute those same features in, in, in exactly the same way. And I'll, I'll try and let you know when that's the case. But if, if you're building apps that are relying on some of these functions, you should check out the documentation for each of the APIs just to see whether you need to handle anything differently depending on which device it is that you've got. And so that is actually a, a really great time that you can look up the device API, which then tells you what you're currently running on. But we'll look at that one in a minute. We're kind of jumping ahead of ourselves a bit there. Okay, so this one here, battery critical. Um, so we have on battery critical, which is the name of our function, and then what we want to do about it. So in this case, we can type out the battery level critical is at whatever this is, this value, and tell you know let them know that they've got to recharge it. Um, now it's device specific as to what level that is. So battery critical might be 10% on an iOS device. It might not be. It might be 2% or something on an Android. It can be different. But um, that is a function that at least it's, um, you can subscribe to. All right, now camera is the next one. Camera's in another API. And we looked at this one last week. Now, I'll go over it again just so that we're just for complete completeness sake, I guess, just so that we, we're covering off everything. So get picture is the main one for this. And by default, it will return you a memory dump of all the information in memory, which you can then format and save or do whatever you like, output onto the screen, replace a current image that's there, whatever you want. Um, now, you can also, um, if you set up a preference within your config file, you can see, make sure that geolocation information comes across with that photograph. So, in every photo, there's something called EXIF data, E-X-I-F, and that data has a lot of information regarding what the camera was that took the photo, um, what its aperture was, um, all sorts of information, the time, the date, that kind of thing. And it also has geolocation information available with it as well. This is obviously something really that's restricted to smartphones because normal DSLR cameras and things like that uh, don't have that by default. Um, but this is also, something that uh, crops up every now and then again, again with privacy issues with some social media sites that allow you to upload photos and they don't take the EXIF data off and as a result uh, anybody surfing through there can go and click on your photo, um, download it, put it into an EXIF reader and then see exactly where that photo was taken which can be an issue if you're you know taking photos in your house or something so things to be careful of. I believe actually that Facebook strips EXIF data off I did check that, that at one stage. Um, I, I'm pretty sure they take it off. So, so Facebook itself is actually safe, but um, there are other ones that um, that don't do that. But that's a bit of an aside. But seeing as you're building apps, it's useful to know that. So, if you do want to build a spy application, and thinking about things that you want to build over these next couple of weeks, um, you can tag that geolocation onto uh, onto your photographs and and take that so that that's, um, that's able to be stored. All right, so here's the code for it. <clears throat> and this would look a little bit familiar from what we did last week. We have, we call get picture. On success is if you successfully take a photo. Again, this is the name of our own function here. So this can be anything you want. And that gets called there with the image data in it. If it fails, then it calls this one down here, which is the on fail one. And then we have a bunch of parameters which basically set up how you want the photo taken. And I'll, we'll go into this in, in a second. 
So in this case here, if we've got a successful image that's been taken by the camera, then we're going to replace the source of that image with what it was that we just took. So um, image here is we're getting the element by ID straight out of the HTML and then we're replacing it with the image data. So this is what we did last week where we captured the image data from the camera and then we replaced it, or replaced an image that was already on screen. Okay. Now we can also do uh, file URIs as well. So there's different kinds of destinations that we can grab it for. So here's a data, data URL and a file URI, which they're two different things um, and which will allow us to do things like perhaps saving the image if you want to do that as well. So saving it onto a, uh, into a file rather than just say putting it on screen. Okay, now here are some settings. So the, as I said, there are a bunch of settings and things that you can do um, before you take the photo. So this is where we're, where we're going to send it. Is it just going to be returned as data or is it going to be returned as a file? This is the source where we're actually getting it from. So we can actually choose the front or the back camera too. So if, if your device has one, so it doesn't have to be necessarily uh, the, the forward facing camera. Um, whether you're going to allow it to be edited, um, what kind of um, photo this is going to be, whether it's going to be a JPEG or a PNG or anything like that, the quality that you're shooting at, um, how big you want the file to be, so it can get scaled down as well, and then the way that this is going to pop up as well. And again, this will depend a little bit on the device as well, um, because some operating systems will let this happen or not, whether or not it's going to pop up sort of within your app or it's going to pop something over, that kind of thing. So there are a lot of settings there. Again, um, this, this is not all of them. So you, if you really want to get into this, go and have a look online and find out every single um, function or um, setting that's available for you there. Okay, so these are the the options that we've got of destination type. So as, as we saw then, this is basically returning it in memory so that we can then just write it over the top of an existing image or just send it to an image. This one here is returning it as a file so that it actually stores it locally. And then this one is similar, um, but it's just sort of in relation to an existing library, which you don't need to worry too much about that at the moment. All right. And so a few more settings as well. We can see where we want to get our uh, source image from. It can either come out of the library or it can come out of the camera or it can come from a saved photo album as well. And we can save it out as a JPEG or a PNG and then we can use the front or the back camera. So quite a few different settings there. Now, if you want to build an app that's significantly more complex than this, so say you want to do image manipulation of individual pixels or something, then you probably wouldn't use this particular API. This API is literally just for taking a photo, saving it or changing an image. Um, if you want to go lower level than that, we do have further APIs that are available to get into sort of direct image manipulation at a, at a lower level. So all, all totally possible. Okay, so, and I guess this is, I've kind of half answered this question already. What if I want video? Well, in this case, this is only for taking photographs. If you want to do video, you can use something called Media Capture, which is another API, which we've got here. We're going to have a look at that. That's a, a slightly lower level API in terms of what you can do. Um, but if you want to access camera features that are not available through the current API, you do have access to other APIs, third-party ones you can download as well, um, or you could perhaps even write your own. But at that point, then you're having to write uh, native code, um, which uses you know a bit of work. But you can certainly develop your own uh, plugins if you want to. So here's an example of one that you can add. This is quite a popular one. This is called Video Capture Plus, and it is very powerful. Um, and it's it's a plugin for PhoneGap that is uh, supported by Adobe um, and will work well. Now, on the Adobe site um, under Build, you can actually go in there. You can have a look at their supported plugins that they've got. Um, so before you rush off and start plugging in lots of third-party plugins, um, it would be worthwhile just seeing which ones are supported because you want to make sure you've got ones that are supported across all platforms before you start using additional ones. So Adobe maintain a list of ones that they've supported and they know are high quality. And I'd suggest that you use those ones and I'll show you where that is soon. So as I said, there are lots and lots of different plugins. Um, and it's worth just having a browse through that library before you think about 
developing something, um, not that you may be about to jump into plugin development, but um, it'll also give you some ideas for apps when you have a look and see what's currently out there. I mean, there's like a there's a social media plugin, for instance, which will post to every single different type of social media for you, uh, rather than having to you know add one for Twitter and one for Facebook and Instagram and all that kind of thing. Uh, so here, actually, this is this is uh, off the Adobe side. Here you can see a few, and this this is a one just one screenshot out of a very long scrolling list. So we can see we've got push plugin. I'm, I'm going to talk about push plugin a bit later on because that's for doing push, push notifications. Um, there's a barcode scanner, social sharing, sharing is there, Facebook Connect, a um, whole bunch of this stuff. Um, so barcode scanner is is pretty powerful. That's one that you wouldn't expect to have in a and I guess one of these kinds of apps, that's definitely more something that you would see in a native app. Um, so to have access to have a native barcode scanner straight into effectively your HTML application is very, very powerful. So you can scan QR codes and things like that and then read that information back and um, you know do something with it, load load something off the net or whatever it is you want to do. And you can also generate barcode scanners, out, uh, barcodes themselves off that too. All right. So the next API that I want to have a look at is the contacts one. Uh, now, the first thing to be aware of is on iOS, iOS is very heavily locked down, uh, certainly in comparison to Android anyway. Um, and what it will do is if you try and access certain functions, iOS is going to pop up a privacy notification, ask whether you want to do it. So you're probably familiar with this if you already have a, an iPhone, um, but what is the idea of it is to stop um, anybody kind of getting access to things that they shouldn't have unless the user has specifically said that that's okay. Uh, so this includes the contact list, it includes the microphone, it includes the GPS. Um, oh, there's a few other things as well. Uh, you can't, for instance, in iOS, you can't send an email directly out of your app because it could effectively be generating spam in the background. So you actually have to call the existing mail app and you can pre-fill it. And then then the user has to press send. So there's things like that. Uh, even, even things like um, making a phone call, um, it will actually pop up a different screen and then allow you to, to do it. So it's, and same with messages too, SMSs. So um, it can be a little bit annoying if you want your app to be doing a lot of stuff uh, very quickly by itself or in the background, but um, iOS is, is locked down for privacy reasons more than anything else, just to make sure that nobody's doing anything dodgy in the background, like, you know, making a phone call in the background to a to a number and, you know, charging so that you're, it's costing you money or anything like that. So uh, they've pretty, pretty, been pretty careful with that. All right, so with that said, um, if the user does give access to the contacts when you try and do it, then we can go ahead and do some pretty powerful stuff with that contact list. Now, we've got to add the plugin in, obviously, as we have in the past. And then what we can do is we can do things like find a contact. We can create a new one. We can save it. We can copy one and clone it. Uh, we can remove contacts as well. We can, we can update them. We can add new addresses, all sorts of stuff. Um, very, very cool. So here's a bit of code. So we'll have a look and see what this is doing. So if we start down here, this is a find all contacts piece of code. So we're going to start off by setting up some options where we're going to, um, this is our contact find option. So basically what um, the parameters that we're going to set before we go and, and look for contacts, and which in this case is pretty much nothing. We want to find them all. So options.filter equals that. It's blank and we're going to find them all. Okay, and we're going to find, um, we're going to return the names and addresses, and then we call navigator.contacts.find with our filter, which is our, our blank filter, and then we, you'll recognize this from previous code, on success and on error. So on success is the function that will be called if it all works, on error will happen if it doesn't work, and then these are the options that we're setting of the way we want to go and search for something. So um, we have a filter for display name and addresses and options of nothing. And so we call find, and if it all works out, then this is called, this function here. And this will return in this structure here called contacts. And then we can look through it all and do something with it. So 
we know the contacts length here. This will be the number of contacts that it returns. So we do a loop here. We've got two loops here. So we're going to go from one to, or from zero rather, until the end of the contact list. And then we'll, we'll call this loop inside here for every single instance of this one. So if you've got 10 contacts, it's going to loop around 10 times and do this inside here. So what have we got an extra loop for? Well, the reason why is that a contact could have multiple addresses. So even though most people would perhaps only have one address, we still need to make sure that we've got them all. So what that's going to do is for each contact, it will loop around and then print out, we'll do an alert for the address details for all of them, which in this case is um, the preference, the type, the formatted, whatever that is, we did actually have to print this out and see what it is. Um, street address, locale, uh, region, postcode, and country. So that's all the information that's associated with that particular contact. So this one here might be quite handy if you wanted to build an app, uh, let's say, to, let's say what you might want to do is create an app with a list of all your contacts um, running down the screen. In a, in a scroll window perhaps, and then when you clicked on it, it would return you a nicely formatted new screen with the details of your contact. So that would be a good little application that you might want to write. And, and perhaps from there, if you really want to get into it, then you could update the contact. So in that way, then you've written your own native contact lister and you know address book updater, and it's, it's going to then um, update your contacts directly in the phone as well. All right. If we want to create a new contact, we do navigator.contacts.create here. And then we set up some phone numbers here. I mean, we don't, we don't have to have three, but in this, time, in this case, we work mobile and home. And then we set the contact.phone numbers to be that list, and then we save it. Okay, so most of the stuff here, even if it doesn't look, um, particularly obvious, there are examples online for all of this with all the functions, all the parameters, everything you need. So um, you don't need to memorize this or anything like that. When you come to, to actually write it, all you need to do is go and look up the API reference and all programmers do this. So yeah, it's nothing you know, to feel like you need to know everything back, back the front, inside out. Um, you just go and look it up and say, I want to create a new contact and then you just work out how to do it. So create, set, all the details you want done, um, and then save it. Okay. All right, so that, that's it for contacts. We can do more. Um, we can do quite a bit more, um, but I've only just shown you the basic stuff, which is finding and saving. But there are lots of other things you can do with it as well. But this should at least give you a, a good idea of what's possible. All right. Now, the next one is device. Now, you might wonder why would we want to do this? It's not as flashy as using GPS or anything like that, but device is probably one of the most useful APIs that you're going to come across. There's a, a number of reasons why you might want to use it. Um, probably the immediate one is to determine what phone or handset the user's got um, so that you can determine whether you need to make any changes in your APIs depending on device. Now, we, we've already mentioned that some of these APIs behave slightly different depending on um, what device the user is on. So as I said, it could be GPS or it could be Compass or who knows what. Um, they all, they just have subtle differences. So you may need to, to have some kind of if-then-else statements in there that will have a look and work out what the user is actually on to determine what we're going to do. So say, for instance, if you want to do a, a camera app, um, but the user's on a a device without a camera, well, you kind of need to handle that gracefully, and you can work that out by finding out what the device is first of all, or, or even it could be, uh, you know, if the user's on a, an iPad as opposed to a, to an iPhone, they've got a completely different resolution, different size screen, so perhaps you want to lay it out differently. So all things to think about. Um, so we can figure that out here. We add the plugin here, which is the device plugin. And then we can do something about that. So these are the uh, fields that we have access to. Um, Cordova itself, which we'll look at in a sec, um, 
we've got the model, we've got the platform, we've got the UUID and we've got version. So we'll have a look at what these mean. So if we want to get, if we call model, this is what you would return, or this is what would come back if you were on iOS. If you were on iPad mini, you would get this iPad 2,5. If you're on iPhone 5, you get iPhone 5,1. There is a complete list of what these all are. So this will let you know um, exactly what kind of iPhone or what kind of iPad it is. So you'll know whether it's an iPhone 4 or 5 or, or 6 or 5S or anything like that. So that will allow you from that point to then work out what the capabilities of the device are. Um, and you can see the same thing for, for Blackberries. Um, if you're in a browser as well, it'll, it'll even work that one out for you. Um, and there are code names. So you would need to, to actually look these up to see what these are. Um, but you can certainly then do if then else kind of statements once you've got that information. Okay, now this one here, UUID. Now, UUID is something which is extremely useful. Now, it is different from UDID, which I'll, I will show you. I've got the next screen, which is going to tell you about that. Um, but what this lets you do is it returns a number which is unique to this device. And it means that you can reference it um, when a user comes back later. So I guess what you would normally do with this is, say, for instance, um, trying to think of a, a good example of where you would use this. Um, in a game, perhaps, you might want to know uh, how often is it this, the user comes back on this particular device. So it could be that they have an account, and but this account, they can sign in on iPad, iPads and iPhones and uh, Androids and all sorts of stuff. Um, but you'd like to track how often this particular device is being used and how often it crops up. And so you can actually access it with this particular um, thing called the UUID. So it is slightly different depending on which device you're on. On Android, it's uh, a 64-bit integer. And now that's generated when the device first starts up. Um, BlackBerry, it's nine digit, unique ID. Um, iPhone, now it's a unique hashed value comes from, from a whole bunch of stuff the way it makes it. Um, and it's guaranteed to be unique for every device and can't be tied to the user account. Um, now, now's the time to talk about this. So you might have heard of something called a UDID. And what this was, was a, um, it was hardware specific. It was locked to the actual hardware of the phone. Every time, it didn't matter what the app was that would fire up, it would return the same UDID. Uh, Apple decided that there were privacy issues with this um, because they were getting used for too much tracking information um, b between applications and they decided that it was basically giving out too much info that um, nobody required that level um, of privacy of information being given away I guess it, w it was you know starting to issue uh, create issues with privacy so so what they came up with something called a UUID um, and it's not tied directly to the hardware in that it will be different when you run different apps and if you undelete or if you rather if you delete your app and you reinstall it you'll get a new UUID it won't be the same one so that's something to keep in mind um, previously you could actually delete the app you could fire it up again and then you could identify the user as having already had that app in the past with that new DID but um, and now that has actually changed. So it's a privacy issue, and um, but it does allow you to keep referencing that particular piece of hardware for the lifetime of your app while it's installed on that phone. So it's a, it's a very useful thing to have because um, there are often times where you may not have the concept of an account uh, stored on your phone, um, but you need to be able to work out that this is a particular device that was installed at a certain time. So sorry if the I can't give you the best example for that. Um, I have used it a few times in the past, but I'm just struggling to think of a, a good example that makes it clear. OK, um, device version. This one's handy because this one will tell you the version of the operating system that's being run. So it's all very well to know that somebody's running an iPhone 5 or an iPhone 6. But if you don't know that they're running iOS 8 or iOS you know, six or something, um, then you really have no idea of the capabilities of that device. A lot of things change between versions, so you do need to, to work out exactly 
what that hardware is. This stuff is very, very useful. And it allows you to, to, to make sure that your, your app doesn't break, really, so that you're taking into account all the potential variables that are out there as to what people have got. OK, uh, next one, look at the accelerometer. So the accelerometer is a motion sensor. And as it says here, it detects a change in movement in the x, y, and z directions. So left and right, back and forward, up and down. The thing to know about an accelerometer, though, is it doesn't tell you where you are. It only tells you how fast you're moving or that, well, actually, it's not even so much how fast you're moving. It's telling you how fast you've moved from one point to another. It's, it's it, how, what your rate of acceleration is. So basically like your g-force. So if you wanted to build an app that would take advantage of the accelerometer, it could be perhaps something like uh, working out how many Gs you pull when you drive around a roundabout. That's probably the worst example, actually. I can't come to think of it. Maybe I'll scratch that one. <laughs> Don't want to have anyone going out and crashing their car while they're testing their app. Um, what you could do, this is often used in games. So uh, the, the accelerometer is used, say, like a pinball machine, for instance, where you are rotating your, your app left and right to move a ball around, backwards and forwards, up and down. It detects the change in direction um, of the phone, and therefore you can then decide what you want to do about that. So as I said, this doesn't tell you where you are. It doesn't tell you that you've moved from point A to point B, but it does tell you that you have accelerated from uh, a stationary position to three meters per second or something like that. So you can tell the direction that you're going in and, and the, the change from where you were before. Okay, so a little bit, a little bit complex to understand that. Um, so if you're wanting to write a mapping application, you generally don't use the accelerometer. You would use the compass and the GPS for that. But we'll get to that in a second. All right. So in terms of using accelerometer, these are the things you can do. You can find out how fast you are currently accelerating. You can choose to watch it, which is uh, basically letting you know um, when there's going to be a change in acceleration. And then you can also clear the watch as well. So let me show you an example. So get current acceleration. If you call this, this will then return to you how fast we are currently accelerating in one of those three directions and the current time. Now, under iOS, this is a little bit different. This iOS doesn't like being asked for its current status. So actually, I think I've got a slide about this. Yes. Yeah, so um, if you're trying to do this on iOS, it won't respond. It, well, it will, it will respond, but it'll give you a wrong value. It'll come back and tell you what the current acceleration was last time it decided to tell you rather than when you asked. So iOS likes doing things when it wants to. So there's a better way to do it, and I'll show you that in a second. So, so if you want to get the current acceleration and you want it to work across platform, um, I wouldn't use this function. There is a better one. The better way to do it is this way, and that is you, you actually set up a watch on the acceleration, and you say that you want to get updates every three seconds. So what you're saying is, please let me know uh, what our what's happening with our acceleration every three seconds. And then uh, then on, that'd be great, thanks. And then over here is on success. So on success is the name of our handler. And so every three seconds, this will be called and it will let you know what's going on, okay? So rather than calling this directly to find out what it is, we're doing it via a handler instead. Okay, so here's where we, we set it up, which I think we already did there. And then you clear it when you're finished with it. It's important with some of these ones, particularly things that you're watching where there may be changes over, over time that are quite rapid. So things like the accelerometer, the compass, and the GPS, you should clear watching them when you're finished with them. The reason being is that the, they put a bit of strain on the hardware. Um, or rather, they, they put a strain on your app in that there's a lot of information that's constantly coming in, and your app has to handle that. So if you're wanting your app to do other things besides just listen to stuff, then only really set these up when you're actually interested in it. All right, next one is Compass. Compass, again, is its own API. You need to set it up and add it into your project. And the Compass will measure anything from 0 to 359.99 in degrees. So zero is north, and then it rotates around in clockwise direction until we get to 359.99. And so 
we can get the current heading. And again, this is setting up a, a handler for it. At, well, we can, and then that will return back and say a heading. And we actually have magnetic heading and true north as well. Um, there are two, they're slightly different. Um, and this will come back and let us know which direction we're going. Okay, so in degrees. So we're, which, which way basically the phone is orientated. So really is what that's telling you. Okay, so here's another one. We can watch it, see what's going on. And this is the same as what we saw last time. So let us know the heading of where we're going every three seconds and update that for us. So you might want to write a little compass app. You could easily do this. And uh, as the, and then as you rotate the phone around, it would update, say, a text box or something and tell you the degrees of which way the phone is orientated. So that would be a good little app that you might want to build to take advantage of the compass. And perhaps you could do the same thing with, with the accelerometer as well. You could, uh, you could see how fast you can move your phone in one direction and see how many uh, g-forces are you kind of generating in different directions. Okay. Next one is geolocation. So geolocation is talking to the GPS and then the GPS will report back its absolute position of where it is. Now, again, this is one that's gonna call a privacy pop-up first of all, uh, and it will make sure that it'll, it'll actually ask the user whether they um, are fine with the GPS accessing this. Um, and, and this actually brings up another point. If somebody says no, uh, you have to make sure that your app is going to be able to handle that so that in the event that a person says, no, I really don't want you to access the GPS, then make sure that your app's not going to break. If it really, really relies on it and needs to have the GPS, then you need to be popping up a warning every time it accesses it or, or have some kind of overriding global variable that says, I'm sorry, we can't use this app without accessing the GPS because it just won't do anything. So um, make sure that you handle those gracefully um, because there's nothing worse than you know forgetting that well, I suppose as a programmer when you tend to test things you 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 test them so that they don't break kind of unconsciously or you always click yes and you sort of don't think that somebody else might actually click no on it and so I've found the best way to test applications to, to give them to my mother uh, somebody or someone just that knows nothing about what your device is or what you're trying to do or you know the, the least amount of knowledge is actually better because they tend to break things in far more creative ways and just ways that you would never think because you're sort of as a developer you're kind of always thinking in one certain direction so it really does help to have people around like that, that uh, you can just give things to and just see what happens and watch, watch them break stuff all right so here's a uh, geolocation now this is to get the current position so here again pretty much exactly the same way as we've done everything in the past. We set up a callback uh, on success and on error. On success over here, it's going to start giving us our GPS coordinates. Now you can notice here that there's a bit of information that comes back from it. If we get latitude and longitude, we also get altitude and accuracy, altitude accuracy as well, and some degree of heading and speed. Now these are not as accurate as using a compass and using an accelerometer. So um, you've, you've got to realize that GPS is, on a phone is accurate to about three meters. Uh, that's about the best you can really hope for um, and often not that much. So you can't really use the GPS for measuring things like you know if you wanted to start using it as a tape measure or something, it's, it's not going to work because it just don't, simply doesn't have that accuracy. There are other methods that you can use uh, and uh, iOS in particular, I mean, I know more about iOS because that's what I tend to develop in natively, but um, the, you can use Bluetooth to, to get down to around a centimetre if you want to really get down to those sort of levels of distance, um, but you wouldn't really be using GPS because it's not designed for that. And um, even though GPS, there's some argument that it's actually capable of doing it, but because it's a military system, they haven't released that um, to the public. Um, and there are interesting things too in terms of, I remember reading, I don't know if this is still current or not, but that the GPS system would shut down uh, within apps if you exceeded a certain speed because it was basically then um, being used as, you could be used as something like a missile guidance system um, just within an iPhone. So um, I know there are various rules like that where it, will, it just won't work anymore just, to, just because of concerns of what you possibly might want to use it for. Okay, uh, so now the other thing on there, so we've got latitude and longitude. Altitude here, altitude 
also can't really be determined very well from a GPS. Um, now GPS, as you would know, uses a whole bunch of satellites that it gets access to. It kind of triangulates it all and works out the distance between it to work out where you are. Um, and so that's really, really good at kind of working out where you are on a plane, but not so good at working out where you are height-wise. And so that's now sort of being addressed um, by having a barometer in some of the newer phones. And the, a barometer is actually for measuring altitude. And so that's one way that we're able to determine el um, how high you are, I suppose. Um, but that's only on, on recent phones. It's only something that's just come in. But uh, the G getting access to the GPS is certainly something a lot of fun. You can spend a lot of time with us doing all sorts of things of um, moving things around on maps and all sorts of stuff. Um, okay, so here's some here's again an example. So the one we looked at before was getting the current position. We can also watch a position as well. So in this case here, we want to we want to set up um, that we on success. We're going to pop this up here and say what our current latitude and longitude is and we'll throw up an error if we don't see anything after 30 seconds and um, so just in case something sort of died there there are a lot more parameters and things you can do like how often you want to check and that sort of stuff as well but again most of this is in the uh, in the book so the website rather so we won't go into it all at the moment now you can also set up high accuracy too. So there are, again, this is a little bit like the parameters when we looked at the camera. Um, a lot of options there, of things you can do to, to uh, you know, change what you're getting back from the GPS. So if you really need high accuracy for, for something like navigation, um, then you can enable that as well. And then just like the other ones, clear it when you don't want to use it anymore because it's, it's simply just going to be using up too many resources. Okay, so there's a bit of a description. I've kind of gone through most of the stuff of exactly what that is. Okay, next one, recording and playing back of audio. So you can actually write your own little audio recorder if you want as well, all completely through PhoneGap. Um, you add the media plug in there. So some of the things, we'll go through some of this fairly quickly actually because it's uh, there is a lot and you know, I really just want to give you an example of what's available. So um, we can get the current position of where, when we're playing something back, how far through the file we are. We can see how long the file is. We can play, pause. Release, um, that's when you've sort of finished using it. Um, fast forward or go backwards to find where you're going, turn the volume up and down, and then start and stop record and stop playing. So um, all the basic information that you would need to write a little little audio player. So here's an example here. Um, playing audio is, is pretty simple. So we set up something called new, new media type here. Um, this one's actually going to play back from a URL. So this is playing back off the internet from something. And then we call a callback and then we just play it. So it's, it's quite simple. There's not too much to it at all. Now this one here is if we want to seek to uh, a, a position and or rather actually, let me read this. No, it's not. What this is doing is it's actually getting our current position of where we are. So as it's playing back, it's going to send back to a callback to a function and tell us where we're currently at. So while it's playing. So you could use this to, to have a playhead. So you press play and then you see moving along something along the bottom saying how far through the file you are. So quite useful to have. Here's another one. So play, stop, release. Okay, everything to just to get in this file to play. Um, where we want to jump to just to move through the file and setting the volume. So it's all pretty simple, all there. Um, here's another one. So what we might want to do in this case, is we set the whole thing up, we press play, and then you can set a timeout so that after two seconds, then it's going to set the volume to zero. So I don't know why you'd want to listen, listen to two seconds of audio, but anyway, that's how you do it. And then you can turn it up as well. So um, lots of stuff there. Now recording is probably a little bit more interesting. This will actually record to an MP3. So we create a new media file here and we have our our callbacks set up to let us know that it's all working fine and then we press then we just start recording and it will record it internally and save it for us. Um, this one is pretty much the same we press start record except this is going to stop it after 10 seconds. Okay so again a pretty powerful kind of system so you can write your own recorder 
Um, I'm not sure that that would be something you could probably build in a week, but who knows? Who knows what you might want to have a go at? It, all the functions are there for you anyway. Now, if you want to go more sort of low level, that last one we looked at there is is pretty high level. Stop, start, record, stop, you know, save, all that kind of stuff. It's it's all there. Um, but again, there might be times when you want to do things that are at a, at a a lower level where it's not just starting and stopping things. Um, so there is something called the Media Capture API, and this is used for audio, video, and images. So like we looked at with the camera, if you want to go deeper, this is the one that you would use. Okay, so we add that in to, to there, and this is the sort of stuff that we can do. So we have these main areas, capturing image, capturing video, capturing audio and then getting the data as well so we can get it out in various different formats after it's been captured and then over here these are all the options so lots and lots of different options for what you want to set things up as and again this is not something that I want to spend a lot of time and just really highlight it to you so that if it's something you're interested in you can go and you can play with it in a little bit more detail so this is capturing audio which is pretty much recording effectively of what we would have looked at in the last API except we set, we set up a new device to capture, capture the audio, capture success is this one. If it fails, it goes to this one. And in this case, what we're doing here is it's actually going to record a couple of different files. So we can record uh, one for 10 seconds and record another one for, for 10 seconds. So this is pretty much the same as what we were looking at before, but just done in a different way and we've got access to more. So this is set up in the options. We've got more options here. So as you can see here, this one's going to set up for three media files of 10 seconds each. Uh, this one here is capturing video. So we haven't done video up until this point because video is going to be done at the one of the lower level APIs, which is this is the one. And again, it's pretty simple. And in terms of our coding anyway, what we, we have access to, it's really the same as doing audio. Okay, so that's uh, just before we jump into that. So, capture success, number of lengths, and then we just give it a path of where it's going to store it. Now, there are, if you want more information on this, there are a lot of examples online. It's just a matter of really looking up the name of this, the API. So, the API name for this one is Media Capture. If you do a Google search for Media Capture and Phone Gap, you'll provide, you'll be given a lot of source code. So, the great thing is because Phone Gap is so popular, um, and the APIs are really quite simple you'll find a lot of examples. So you're not going to really struggle too much. Uh, and and pretty much anything you want to do, other people have done in the past too, or they've got stuck in the same areas. So um, I do, Google really is your friend when it comes to this sort of thing. Okay, uh, it's only a couple more that I want to look at um, tonight, just so that we're not spending the entire time just going through API reference documents. Uh, vibration. So this is a really nice, easy one that you can set up. Very little that you need to do with vibration. You just add the vibrate API in there, and then you call it from here. Now, iOS doesn't respond to the time uh, parameter at all, um, but the others will. So it'll just give you a vibration, and that's it. You used to be able to call things like vibration patterns. Uh, you can't do that anymore. So it's simply just vibrate, and then that's all it will do. All right, so other plugins that are available to you. And ones that can be quite useful. SMS is one. So if you want to send an SMS at the moment without having this plugin, you've really got to format a URL just the same way as you would um, with HTML and, and have SMS in the URL. And that will then, when somebody uh, presses it as a link, then it will pop up as an SMS message. But it's not really flexible. We'd really like to have SMS built into your app to do a little bit more than that. So, um, so you, there are plugins for that. Also for phone dialing, um, push plugin. We talked about that one. I'm, we're going to look at that in, in a second, a bit more detail. Barcode scanning, Facebook. If you want an email editor within your app, that's available. Um, access to the calendar. This is a useful one. Calendar is not. Uh, available to PhoneGap by default. So you do need to add that in. Um, so if you're wanting to, to make changes to the calendar, that's actually a plugin that you, you need to get and add. Now, the installation of these plugins is pretty simple. It's all there. They're all on GitHub at the moment, and they tell you exactly how to do it. And it's very simple. If you've, if you've managed to get to the point of actually installing PhoneGap, 
then adding this stuff is is a walk in the park in comparison. So don't stress too much if you think that um, you're not going to be able to add plugins in because configuring a local installation of PhoneGap with a, an, an emulator and things is much more difficult. Um, flashlight's another one too. You can get the access to the hardware flashlight if you want to as well. Um, lots of cool stuff. Now, now this one here, I just wanted to give you an example. So this is for push notifications because I remember a couple of weeks ago, someone asked if it was possible to do um, with PhoneGap and, and it completely is. The the issue with push notifications, um, actually probably what I should do first is define what a push notification is. People might not be aware of what they are. Um, basically with an app, you can set it up as long as you have user permissions, that is, so that um, you can send a message to the user from your app. So push notifications are really powerful because once the app is on the phone, if the user agrees to it, then you've got a way that you can directly contact the user. So say you've got a your own business and you've got a sale on, you can send a push out to everybody who's got their app installed and said, you know, next 10 minutes, come to the store and get 20% off, something like that. Um, or, or you know, there's loads of reasons why you could use push. The, the the great thing about it is that you you you're bringing your app back into the foreground of a, a person's mind, I suppose. Um, because the problem it always has been is that once an app's on a phone, then you know how do you get the user to go back and use it again? Um, they've got to either be very engaged with it, um, or you know it just is going to sit there on the phone till they delete it. A, a push notification allows your app to come back up with a message like an SMS, and then you can display whatever information you want. So uh, the push notifications works a little bit differently depending on what device you've got. So it, I, um, Androids and iOSs handle them differently and they're actually sent differently. So what we can do is we can handle it. This is with um, that new um, push plugin that I mentioned before. And so what we do here is we detect first of all what kind of device we're on. If it's Android, then we set it up, we register it in one way, and if we're on an iOS device, or even BlackBerry was different again, for an iOS device, then we register it this way, slightly differently. So looking here, we've got badge, sound, alert, and ECB, where, which is the, um, the notification itself of what you want to do when it receives one. And so badging is, if you've seen uh, like a little red circle that sits on the app icon itself with a number in it. That's called the badge. And so that generally means that there's something new that's happening on your device and then it encourages people to click on it and see what that is. And that relates to push notifications. So Snapchat and Facebook and all those ones all use this stuff. Uh, so you can set up a sound as well to play when a push notification comes in, whether a user is going to re receive an alert or whether it's just going to silently update in the background. Um, and then this here, on notification APN, this is what's going to happen. The actual code, basically, it's your callback of what's going to happen when you receive that push. So here is our function here, which is quite simple. It just pops up an alert and says, you know, you have received one, and plays a sound or something like that. And you can even change the badge number there as well. And so again, this is a this is a whole API in itself with a lot of documentation that tells you exactly how to do it. Now. If you're wanting to get into push notifications, push notifications are not hard to code, but they are extremely difficult to configure. So you have to configure from the back end um, to make sure you're pushing it out. They all require certificates. The apps themselves require certificates as well. Um, the certificates are different whether you're in production or whether you're in development. Uh, so getting these working, I would say, of all the things that I've ever done in native app development and any other kind of app, development really this is one of the most difficult and it really comes down to the configuration more than anything else getting it right so even after your code's 100 percent right getting these things to actually work can be can be a little bit of a pain um, now there are push notification services that you can make use of with uh, hosted back-end services things like um, urban airship is one uh, they send out push notifications for you so um that would definitely be a place to start so that you're not having to build your own back end as well as trying to build the front end to handle it all. And the great thing about those services is they step you through exactly how to configure your apps across multiple platforms to make sure they work. So that would be a place to start um, to make it easier, for sure. Okay, uh, next one, barcode scanner. So this was a third party one. And again, really, really easy to set up. Um, you just call the scan function 
and then it comes back with a result or an error and then you've got the value that's come back all, that's all you've got to worry about because all the rest of it is taken care of for you all right well nearly at the end so i'm going to um set you a task this week so since next week is our final week um will be I'll, actually i'll tell you what we're going to be working on in a minute there but what i'd like you to do is is to maybe go back through some of these slides if there's anything that's sort of jumped out at you that you think might be quite exciting um i'd i would really encourage you to to get into that um bearing in mind you will have to create some html around this so you're going to have to have some kind of html framework or or structure there uh, to host it all but um, call some API methods, so whether it's the camera or it's your recording an audio file or handling the GPS and putting it on a map or, you know, it could be anything. Um, but I'd like you to have a play around with it. Um, and as I said, I'll, I'll have a look through this week and I'll have a look through the homework that you've done as well for me over, over this, these past few days. And next week we'll showcase some. So we'll, I'll get some stuff up on the slides and um, acknowledge everybody who's worked really hard on it. Um, but we're nearly there now. So we've covered off most of the API of what's available to us. And then next week, thank you, let me just jump forward a bit. Well, we've already talked about that. Next week, we're going to look at how we would actually get it onto the store. So we've looked at now pretty much almost everything to do with how to write the code. And then next week, we're gonna look at, well, what's the next stage, which is setting up things like distribution profiles and development profiles and, and uh, keys and all that kind of stuff. Um, there is a little bit more uh, technical stuff that we'll need to do as well. Um, I'll, I'm going to cover off how to access a remote server. So if you want to um, push data out or pull data in from, from off a server, how you would do that. Some of that is more HTML5 kind of related, but seeing as we're, we're dealing with apps, it's something that you would want to do. Um, dealing with dynamic data as well. So the example that I gave you in HTML before that you saw, I'd pre-filled all that data, but that's probably not realistic. We're going to pull, want to pull that out of a database or like a local database or a remote server. So so that's stuff that's, that's very, very important. It's very real world scenario kind of related so we'll be dealing with that as well and if we have time as well um, depending on how much we get through next week I'd, I'll look at trying to actually integrate a phone gap project into an existing native one so that was another question that we had I think last week or the week before was how you would go about doing that so actually taking a project that might be sort of half natively built and then taking stuff out of Cordova or phone gap and and putting it into that project so that it works and then there's a little bit more on the API that we'll cover off, but that mainly relates to what we're talking about here with storage and, and um, databases and things like that. All right. Well, that's, uh, that's it for tonight. Um, I might just uh, hand back to James for a sec then and see if there's been any questions or anything that we want to talk about before we finish up. Hey, Steve. Hey, everyone. Right. Um, yeah, I've just got a few questions uh, sitting here if, if you'd like to answer a couple mm, of them. Sure. Um, Rocky was just asking about the push notifications. Mm. Um, if we are doing push notification from the app itself, the app has to be running, right? Uh, Unless you register for background tasks. If you, okay, if, if you're wanting to, to oh, I have to understand what he's saying, because a push notification is actually receiving a push. So, uh, I mean, the app, the app doesn't actually push back to the server. Uh, what happens is that the... Uh, a message comes from the server as a push notification. We then re respond and realize we've got one. Um, that has what's called a payload in it, which is just a very small amount of information. It generally doesn't contain an entire message. And then what you would do is you'd then go back to the server and retrieve the entire thing. So to give you an example, um, one that we built recently was for school notices. So a it was a little school app for high schools and they wanted to notify everybody that um, a newsletter had come out. So they would send out a push notification that would say, hey, everybody, um, the new newsletter's out. A user would click on that notification. That would then go back to the server and download the newsletter. So it's, it's um, push notifications don't work in that the user themselves on the phone is talking directly back to the server. They don't in initiate it. It comes from the server. Um, but I'm not sure if that's the question. I'm not, to, I'm not sure exactly what he was asking there. So. 
Yeah, no, exactly. I think probing towards that. That was a that was a good example. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, and actually, Rocky followed up to say uh, a suggestion that uh, Azure push notifications are really easy to set up, and we'll do cross-platform notifications oh, out of the box. Fantastic. Use it then. Yeah, Azure is brilliant, by the way. If anyone's yeah, Azure is just fantastic. We use it a lot for for backend um, databases. It's it's a fantastic system. Yeah. Um, and on, on the same topic, uh, Fred posted to ask the question, what was the service for the push back end that you were talking about? Oh, um, Urban Airship is one. Um, there are a lot of them, um, but that's just one that sort of comes to mind because it's uh, it's it's quite popular and it's, it's available. And I'm pretty sure they've got demos where you can trial it for a while as well. And from memory, I think last time I checked, they supported PhoneGap directly. So, um, But there are a lot. Yeah, I mean, Azure would definitely be worth looking into too if they support that natively. Uh, but I know I know the Urban Airship one is set up so, so you don't necessarily have to be a programmer. Um, it's set up more for marketing teams so they can get them all, all their messages into it and um, very easily configure it. Cool. Thanks. Right. Um, just one other question here that I can field. Uh, mm. Actually, I, f I can't see where it's gone now, but someone was just asking, is it okay to still post up homework uh, for week one and week two? If they miss out on doing it already, uh, of course you can. That'd be great. It's never too late. Um, the reason for doing the homework is for for your own good, everyone. So if you post up any um, any results you've got or any questions you've got, that'd be great. Excellent. Um, just one more question that a couple of people have asked is about um, database access right. <laughs> and, yeah. and local storage access. Yeah, sure, sure. Well, that's actually next week. So, yeah, what, what, what my plan tonight was really to cover off all the hardware-related stuff, and then next week we're going to look at data. So, yes, definitely going to be covering that. So we'll be looking at remote uh, JSON kind of stuff, AJAX, all that kind of thing, and then also local SQLite kind of database stuff. So, yeah, that's definitely an area we've got to look at. Awesome. All right. Very good. All right. So that's all the questions, is it, for tonight? I think that's it for now. Okay, great. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. Thanks for sticking with us. I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing um, what you all come up with. Uh, I'll be a little bit more active on the on the forums this week. So, um, yeah, feel free to, to post your work, and um, I'll get some feedback to you. That'd be great. Very good. All